Hello and welcome. Today, we're going to be looking at the SAT Math Test 1 Calculator section. As always, we're going to be going over every single one of these questions, all 38 of them, so that you know how to solve each one of them. We're going to explain every single question, and we're going to go through the details of every question so that you are ready to ace this test. If you like these videos, please be sure to like and subscribe. I'm not going to bother you with YouTube analytics or the like. Please just hit the subscribe button, and let's get started. The link to this practice test for every single section, not just this section, is in the description. If you want to follow along with me, you can do that. Go to the description. All the questions are going to be right up here. You can look there. We're going to be scrolling through every single question. We're going to scroll through that. We're going to get started. Here we go. All right, let's get on to it with our first question. Here we go. All right, so question number one, we're told that John runs at different speeds as part of his training program. The graph shows his target heart rate at different times during his workout. On which intervals is the target heart rate strictly increasing and then strictly decreasing? And then we're given that graph right there, right? So we can see that there are, it splits, uh, it has it splits into three different parts. We're given four intervals though. And we're trying to figure out which one has strictly increasing and strictly decreasing. So let's figure out what that means. So strictly increasing means that, you know, it's, going oops, it's going up so that just means it's going up it's going that way right it just means that it's not like flat or anything this is this is not strictly increasing this is strictly increasing so by the same token this is strictly decreasing strictly decreasing all right and this is just like flat flat Okay, so we're, we want to find an interval where both of these strictly increasing and strictly decreasing happens. So between 0 and 30 minutes, right, we can just sketch out between 0 and 30 minutes, we see that we have, it goes like this, and it goes like this. So this is, has this part, has a strictly increasing part right here, but it doesn't have this part. It doesn't have that. So that's why this one is not going to work. So choice A is not going to work. And let's look at our next, next choice, 40 to 60. 40 to 60 goes like this. Oops. 40 to 60 goes like this. Right? And if you look at that, that seems like it works, right? We see this here, and then we see this here, strictly increasing, strictly decreasing. So that is going to work. All right. So we can say that this here is going to work. So our answer is going to be choice B. We can look at the other two choices if we want, 50 to 65, right? That's going to look like this, and 70 to 90 is going to look like this. And you can see neither of these fulfill the criteria. So our answer here is simply going to be, so for this question, is going to be choice B. Okay, choice B. So question one is choice B. Are you following along? Hopefully you got that. And let's keep going to the next question. All right. So the next question, scroll down a little bit. Hopefully you can see that. It says, if y equals kx, y equals, oops, y equals kx, where k is a constant, and y equals 24 when x is 6, 6 times k, then what is the value of y when x equals 5? Well, it seems pretty basic here that we can just divide by 6 and figure out this is k equals 4. And we still have y equals kx, which is now y equals 4x, which is going to be 4 times x equals 5. So 4 times 5, which is 20. So 20 is choice C. So question number 2, the answer is choice C. And we can keep going to the next question. All right. So next question. Question three, we are told in the figure above lines L and M are parallel and lines S and T are parallel. The measure of angle one is 35. What is the measure of angle two? Okay, so the thing about parallel lines, right, is that we can get a lot of equal angles out of them. So let's just draw this equation first, right? Um, I don't have like a line function on this board or anything, but we can do the best we can. Okay, so this here is one, and this is two. So this is 35 degrees, 35 degrees. 
And we can use the idea of vertical angles here, and we can say this is also 35 degrees. This is 35 degrees. And if you don't believe me, you can just say, well, this is 35 degrees, and this whole thing has to be 180 degrees. So this part right here is going to be 180 minus 35, or 145. Right? And this part right here is also going to be 180 degrees. So this is going to be 180 minus that, which is going to be back to 35. So vertical angles, right, it's very useful, you know, two sides, they're the same. That's basically, it. it's a pretty easy concept. Now, the next concept we're going to use is the alternate interior angles. So there are a slew of theorems that you, yeah, you probably learn in geometry class um, that have uh, this applied thing of like uh, alternate interior theorem, alternate exterior theorem, complementary the theorem, about all these angles in parallel lines, right? But what do we need to know here, right? So we know that this line right here, this line right here, and this line right here are parallel. Now, what does that mean on a conceptual level? That means that if we put a line through it, like this line right here, like this one right here, we know that this line is going to make the same angle with both of these, right? What does that mean? That means that Let's make a different column. It means that this angle right here is going to be the same as this angle. And this angle right here is going to be the same as that angle. So this is 35, so this is 35. Right? And now the same thing, parallel lines, right? This line is parallel to this line. So if this is 35, then this is going to be the same. So that's also going to be 35. All right? So 35, this 2 right here is going to be 180 minus whatever this is, which is 35. 180 minus 35, we already found, was 145. So by just using some of these neat, some of these neat theorems that we know, just thinking about what parallel lines mean, we can figure out our answer is 145. That is answer choice D for question number 3. And we can keep going to the next question. All right, question number four. If 16 plus x, if 16, 16 plus 4x, 16 plus 4x is 10 more than 14. So that's 10 more than 14. It's just 10 plus 14, which is obviously 24. All right, now we're asked for the value of 8x. Well, let's see, I can subtract 16 from both sides and I get 4x equals eight. And now obviously what I can do right here, I can like, I can obviously do the, I can divide by four and get x equals two and then 8x would be, 8x would be 16. But I can also just skip this step all together by just multiplying both of these by two. So times two times two, times 2, 4x times 2 is 8x, 8 times 2 is 16, our answer is 16, answer choice C. And that is question number 4. Let's keep going. Okay, question number 5, just scroll down a little bit for this one, which is the following graph that shows a strong ne negative association between D and T. All right, what does a strong negative association mean? Okay, so there's a couple things that we need to think about in this whole str strong and negative association. So there's the, obviously there's the strong part. There's the negative part. So there's a strong and a negative part. And then there's also association, you know, you can just, but that kind of goes in with, this is a strong association. So what do each of these mean? So a strong association, a strong association, right, this one right here, it means that as one thing changes, another thing drastically changes. So maybe if D went up, then all of the T's would go up. Or maybe all of the T's would go down. Right? Either way, that's a strong association. Because if something happens, something else will happen for everything. So you see for A, you can, if you look at A, you can see... Uh, it's kind of just a mess, right? A kind of just looks like a mess. 
like you have dots like everywhere like they just don't care where the dots even are it's, it looks like that honestly right so if you were trying to draw like a line of best fit or something to show an association like where where are you going to draw a line in this you can't you can't you can't you can't draw a line like they're you can't draw a line. You, you just can't. Like, I mean, look at that. So, anyway, messy drawings aside, what does, how can we understand which ones apply in there? So, we already ruled out A. So, we know that A is not going to work in this situation. A is not going to work. You just can't draw a line through it. All right, now B. Now, B is just, B is looks like this, right? It's a. And this is our graph, right? So this is a bunch of line, a bunch of dots down here. So I mean, you could draw a line through it, like you could draw this or something, and it'd be decently correct. So that 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 does actually fulfill this strong association part, even though it looks like it's just completely useless, right? And there is a reason that you think it's completely useless because it's all in like one spot. Well, we will get to that in a minute. Okay. So anyway, now let's keep going. Let's look at question, or not question, uh, choice C. Choice C, we, we can see that that looks like this. Right, so again, you can draw a line through that. That's the line. There's a line through that, that works. And then if we look at choice D for a little bit, or not, why did I say a little bit? Um, if we look at choice D, you can see how that, that also, you can draw a line through. So I'm not gonna like do all the dots again, but you can see pretty easily, you can just draw a line that looks like that. And that is going to give you your line. So we, we looked at the word strong association and we ruled this out, right? So we got rid of this. Now, what else does, what else can we get from this question? So we're asked about the negative part. What does negative mean? Negative means, right? Like, I mean, just from the word itself, if one thing goes up, the other thing goes down. So if D goes up, D goes up, then T goes down. If D goes down, then T goes up. That is what this means in essence. Okay, so let's look at our choices. Right? So for B, for B, if D goes up, if we keep going along that horizontal axis, what happens to the T axis? Oh, well, it looks like nothing happens at all. It just stays in one spot. So if D goes up, then T doesn't move like i mean that's not what that says is it that's not if d goes up then t should go down right t is not going down t's just staying there it's just staying there. that's not this is not going to work and on the next one we have c if d goes up we see that t also moves but t goes up as well they both go up which means that there's a positive association not a negative association i did not mean to erase that not a negative association so C is going to have a positive association, not a negative association. So our answer for this question is going to be D. As you can see, if D goes up, if uh, the D axis goes up, horizontal axis goes up, T goes down. Line going straight down. So our answer is choice D. Let us keep going. Let's go to the next question. All right. So... Okay, so we're, we're told a couple of things. We're told that one decagram equals 10 grams, a thousand milligrams equals one gram. Okay, let's see what we can do with that. A hospital stores one type of medicine in two decagram containers. Based on the information given in the box above, how many one milligram doses are there in a one two decagram container? Okay, so two decagrams. Oops, still in a race mode. Two decagrams. Okay, so... When we, when we are faced with units, it's kind of tempting to just start multiplying stuff together. But it's also very easy to get lost if you, if you don't know what you're doing, which is especially true in this case, because Americans don't use a metric system. So we're just kind of confused. Or what, 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 what do we do with this gram stuff? Anyway, we can use this idea called factor label. 
Now, factor label, two different things. Factor label might seem like a lot, right? But it's actually a pretty simple process. So, two decagrams, and we want to find out how many milligrams that is. But it's going to be two decagrams is going to be equivalent to something else. So we're not going to be multiplying this by anything, right? We're going to be multiplying it by one, essentially. So we're going to keep multiplying it by one. Now, how does that help? If we multiply two decagrams by one, you say we get two decagrams. That doesn't do anything. What we can do is we can say one decagram. One decagram is equal to 10 grams. 10 grams. One decagram is equal to 10 grams. Right, so 10 grams, one decagram, so this over this is just going to be one. So that gives you one, you're multiplying it by one. That's how we use factor label. But now you might be asking, like, why did I do that? Like, what is the point? The point is that I now have a decagram in the numerator and a decagram in the denominator. So I can cancel this out and that. And now I get 2 times 10 over 1, which is 20, 20 grams. So I get 20 grams now, 20 grams. And I want milligrams. So I do the same thing. I had to have grams up here in the numerator. So I want grams down here in the denominator. Or just one gram, actually. And we have one gram. So one gram, and that's going to be equal to 1,000 1, milligrams. 1,000 milligrams. So this gram cancels out with that gram. And we get 20 times 1,000 equals 20,000. Right, so once you understand how to deal with the units, it's actually a very simple problem. And our answer is just choice D, right? And that is that for question number six. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Okay, so now we're looking at the rooftop solar panel installations in five cities. So A, B, C, D, and E, five different cities, five different amounts in a bar graph. And we're asked, the number of rooftops with solar panel installations in five cities is shown in the graph above. If the total number of installations is 27,500, what is the appropriate label for the vertical axis of the graph? Okay, so the total number of installations is going to be 27,000. 20, oops, I'm still in the right mode. 27,500. And we want to figure out a unit. We want to figure out a unit for the vertical axis. And we're asked for total. So we're going to add up the ones for the city. So we have 9 for city A. 9 what? We don't know. It's 9 installations in, it might be in tens, it might be in hundreds, it might be in thousands, it might be in tens of thousands. We don't know. That's what we're trying to figure out. So 9 something. 9 something plus 5 for city B of that same something plus 6 of that same something and then 4 somethings and then you have 3, whoops, and you have 3.5 somethings. Okay, so obviously, you know, this is the calculator section, so you have a calculator, but 9 plus 5 plus 6. I mean, plus 4 plus 3.5, you can do that. Calculator, I I mean, I can, I would just do it like that. You know, it's not that hard. 27.5. It's 27.5 somethings. Something. I didn't write the whole thing. 27.5 somethings. 27.5 somethings equals 27,500. Okay. Now we divide the 27.5 from both sides. Here is where you actually, you know, might want to use the calculator. You divide both sides by 27,000, but 27.5, and you get that something equals something is going to equal 1,000. 1,000. All right. If you have 27.5 something, 27.5 thousands, 27,500. So if something is a thousand, right? What does that what does that do? That means that at each one of these, the units of the vertical axis is something in a thousand. It's the number of installations in thousands, which looking at answer choices is choice C.
And that is it. Let's keep going for the next question. Okay. Okay, question number eight. For what value of n, for what value of n is n minus one absolute value plus one equals zero? Okay. And then, so we, we see this kind of, it's, it's a standard equation. I mean, there's an absolute value, but other than that, it's pretty simple. You subtract the one from both sides, and you get n minus one. And that equals, absolute value equals negative one. Now, just, just take a look at that for a second, right? Like, tell me if you see anything wrong. Do you see anything wrong with that equation? Well, the thing that's wrong with this equation is that on this side, you have an absolute value of something. And this side is a negative. So absolute value of something, well, the whole point of absolute value is that it's going to give you a positive something, right? That's like, it's kind of like, you know, squaring something. Like if you square a negative number, you get a positive number. If you share a positive, you get a positive. If you take the absolute value of anything, you're going to get a positive number. And they put a negative number on this side. That doesn't work. You cannot have an absolute value equals negative one. So there are no solutions, no solutions, nothing. It doesn't work. It doesn't matter whatever you put in here. You can put zero in here, zero minus one, negative one. Absolute value negative one is one, not negative one. It will not give you an answer. There are no solutions, no values. So our answer is choice D, no values of N. Choice D, and we can keep going to the next question. All right. Okay. Okay, question nine and 10. We now have this equation. Let's write that down. So a, a is going to be equal to 1,000, 1,052 plus 1.08 t. And we're told that the speed of the sound wave in air depends on the air temperature. The formula above shows the relationship between a, speed, so this is the speed of sound wave, and speed in feet per second, right? Probably shouldn't write that down. Speed in feet per second. And this is the air temperature. So that's temperature. Temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. Oops. Degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. So what do we do now? So we're trying to find the air temperature in terms of the speed of the sound. All right, let's see. So how are we going to do that? How are we going to do that? So we're just trying to isolate T here, right? So if we want to isolate T, obviously we get the T on one side, you get everything else on the other side. So then you just subtract the 1,052 from both sides. And I'm not going to explain everything. You know how to do this. And you just... Pretty simple, and you get to here. And you get t equals a minus 1052 over 1 1.08. So that is going to be choice a, choice a, and that is our answer. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Okay. So, the, uh, no, I'm just going to keep going down. Which of the following air temperatures, which of the following, I'm going to rewrite the equation up here. Which of the following air temperatures will be with the speed of the sound wave be close to 1,000 feet per second? So we want this to be 1,000 feet per second, right? We're told to add close to, well, well, we can just solve for T and then round it to the nearest one, right, of the answer choices. So 1,000 oh, equals 1,052. Plus 1.08, and again, just a linear equation, you know, just you can solve it pretty easily, and you get this. And you get that, negative 52 over... 1.08, and that is going to give you negative 48 
we're going to get a 48.1, which is going to be closer to negative 48 degrees. Answer, choice B. That's question number 10, and we can keep going. All right, so let's keep going. Question number 11, which of the following numbers is not a solution of the inequality 3x plus 5, or 3x minus 5, sorry. Happened to me like 30 times today. 3x minus 5 greater than or equal to 4x minus 3. 3x minus 5 is greater than or equal to 4x minus 3. So I can add 5 to both sides. 3x greater than or equal to... Actually, how about I don't add? No, I'm going, I am going to add 5 to both sides. So it can give me 4x plus 2. Now, the reason this might look a little awkward to you, and the reason I almost like backtracked for a second, is because when we subtract by 3x on both sides, you're going to get 0 is greater than or equal to uh, x plus 2. And this, this is kind of weird, because how do you solve for x if, if it's like this? Right, but obviously you can just subtract by 2 on both sides, and you get negative 2 greater than or equal to x. Now, obviously you could have just like added by, oops, you could have just added by 3 originally at plus 3 plus 3 get rid of this and that's 3x minus 2 and then you subtract and you get negative 2 greater than equal to x no matter how you solve it i mean it's still a linear equation you're going to end up with this same thing right here and you know that if it's less than or equal to 2 it's going to be a solution the one that's not a solution is going to be bigger than negative 2 which is negative 1 and that is choice a choice a that's the answer number 11 and we can keep on going okay number of seeds in each of 12 apples right so we're given a histogram bar chart it's a histogram so we're three so we have some for three we have none for four and then five six seven none for eight and then some for nine so to so the average number of seeds per apple so when we have we have a question that gives you a bar chart and asks for like an average or something Right, what you're going to have to do is find, obviously, the number of seeds total and then the number of apples total. All right, so if we try to find the number of seeds versus the number of apples in total, right, how can we do that? What we can do, right, what we can do is we can say, well, the histogram here is going to have three for, uh, th there are two apples, two apples that have three seeds, two times three. That's six seeds, two apples, right? Two apples, and that gives you six seeds. And then you have none for four, I'm just going to get ignore that. And for four apples in the five category, then you, that makes four times five is 20 seeds. And then for the next one, you have one apple that gives you six seeds, two apples, two times seven, 14 seeds. And then three apples, which gives you three times nine, 27 seeds. So if you sum this up, 2 plus 4 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3, that's going to give you 6, 7, and then 12. And then you sum these up, and you're going to get, what, 83? Is that correct? You know, I kind of have a calculator for this reason. But, um, yeah, uh, 73 is why I have a calculator. 73. Okay, so 73 over 12, which, I mean, you can probably see is like really, really close to 6. Just 6, and, and a 12, but, and 112. But it's mostly just a 6. And then asking which one is the closest, so it's just, just 6. So 6 is C, that is our answer. And we can keep going to the next question. Okay, next question. All right. Question number 13. A group of 10th grade students respond to a survey that asked which math course they were currently enrolled in. The survey data were broken down as shown in the table above. Which of the following categories accounts for approximately 19% of all of the survey respondents? Okay, let's see. So we have a total of 310 respondents. 310 respondents. 310 respondents. I want to find out which category is 19% of that. So we can just take 19% of 310, and that gives you 58.9. So if you can find something that's close to 58.9, or just, you know, 
59 students, and that's it. Now I see 59, I see that in male and geometry. So male second geometry is going to be 59, and that is answer choice C. Let's keep going to the next question. All right, next question. All right, this question that we have length of fish in inches, and we're just given a whole table of just what? 21 values, just 8, 9, 9, 9, 10, 10, 11, 11, 12, 12. I don't know, I'm not going to read out all of them because that would just be a waste of time. All right, so we have the table above this length, the nearest inch, of a random sample of 21 brown bullhead fish. All right, so, so we have some brown bullhead fish, 21 brown bullhead fish. The outlier measurement of 24 inches is an error. Of the mean, median, and range of the values listed, which will change the most if the 24 inch measurement is removed from data? So, without writing a single number down, if we just want to quantify what is going on in this setting, what would we, th what would we think? What would we say? Well, we have, we have a data set. We have a um, data set. We have a data set that has, you know, our like actual regular data, and then we have an outlier. And we calculated, we calculated three values, mean, median, and range. Now, when we get rid of this outlier here, we want to know what is going to happen to these values. Okay. We want to figure out which will change the most if the 24 inch measurement is removed from the data. So these three measurements all have distinctive categories, right? So the thing about the median is that if you change the, if you remove an outlier from the median, it won't change much because the median is structured so that the outliers don't do anything. They do barely anything because on the very end, there are not that many of them, right? So the mean is going to have low, low change. And so we can effectively just cross that. It's probably going to be the least. Now we have the mean and the range. Okay, so now both the mean and the range are heavily affected by outlier. Right? Because, you know, if you, this is a sum divided by the number. So if you add a big thing to it, then it's going to be getting a lot bigger. Same thing with the range. The range is just the biggest minus the smallest. So it's obviously going to get really changed by outliers, that biggest and smallest. Now, which one does more? We see that in the range, we're going from 16 to 24, right? That's the, the range, the, the next biggest value is 16, and then we're going straight to 24. So the range right now is 16, and the new range is going to be between 16 and 8, which is going to be 8. So you're changing, changing by 8. Changing by 8. Now, unless the mean changes by 8, you're not going to get something as big as me. And I think it's pretty clear that while the mean does change a lot because that one, it's not going to change by 8. Right? The range is always going to be the most changed by outlier because it is dependent on the outliers, the biggest and smallest. The mean is going to have a large change because that outliers are not as big as the range, and the median mode all have the least amount of change. So the answer is going to be right here. Answer is range choice C. See, that's our answer, and we can keep going to the next question. Next question. All right, fifteen is okay. It's not on this page. Okay, question fifteen and sixteen refer to the following information: total cost of renting a boat by the hour, and we're given a a line. That's basically a line. What is the c-intercept represented in the graph? The c-intercept is when the other value is zero. So if C intercept, then H is zero. So H when, when H is zero, it's like on that axis, and it says it's five dollars, or you pay five dollars, even though you've used it for like zero. So you, you haven't used it. You haven't. So you haven't used it, and they're charging you money, which seems a bit off. But like you know, I mean. But what we're really trying to do is, you know, what does that five dollars do, right? Why am I paying for something if I haven't even used it? Yet? What does that mean? All right, now what that means, that's like what we call like the flat rate, right? The, what, whatever it's like the, the flat cost at the beginning before you start charging for how long you're renting the boat for, right? So this is going to be the starting cost, the initial cost. This is the initial cost of renting the boat, which is choice A. 
So that's our answer. We can look at the other choices. Total number of votes run in? No. Total number of hours of voting run in? Obviously not. The increase in cost run the vote for each additional hour? That would be the slope. So our answer is A. And we can keep going to the next question. Okay. What is the following represents the relationship between H and C? Okay, so we can write this in like in a y equals mx plus b format. Now here, y is c, m is just, I mean, we have to figure out what m is, but m, and then sort x, h, and then b is going to be the intercept, which is 5. We just found that. So we need to find the slope now, right? So we can just take a point, you know, like after one hour, it's been uh, $8, so you went from $5 to $8 over one hour. So that's just going to be $3 change over one hour. One hour, so that's going to be slope of three. So we can get rid of all this, but the slope is three. So here, this is three. C equals 3H plus five. That is going to be answer choice C. That's question number 16. Let us keep going. Okay. Keep going. So 17, the complete graph of the function f is shown in the xy plane above. For what value of x is the value of f of x at its minimum? So we want to find the minimum. So what do we see is the minimum of this graph? Well, you know, you, you can obviously see the lowest point is going to be the minimum. And we see that the lowest point is negative 2, but it occurs at negative 3. Negative 3. So negative 3, that's going to be b. So our answer is just going to be yeah, you know, that's just how re knowing how to read a graph, you know, nothing, nothing special there. Right, so that is, uh, that was question number, what are we on, 17? So choice B, and we can keep going to the next question. Okay, so now we have a system of inequality. So we have Y, Y is going to be less than negative X plus A, and Y is going to be greater than X plus b. Okay, so which following relations between a and b must be true. Okay. Okay. So we can see that if y has to be greater than x plus b, but it's less than negative x plus a, that means that x plus b is less than negative x plus a. Which means that 2x plus b is less than a. Now, if 0, 0 is the solution to the system of inequalities, so if this is 0, that means that b is going to be less than a. b less than a. b less than a. That's the answer choice a. That's choice a. So b is less than a, you know? Now, we can test out the other ones. Uh, that's, this is the first one, right? a is greater than b, b is less than a, same thing. B is not greater than A, we just prove that it's not, it's less. Uh, absolute value of A is greater than absolute value of B, we don't know that. You know, like, this could be, I don't know, like negative 3 less than 1. Absolute value would be this and this, which is which is that, not less than, so that doesn't work. And then A is equal to negative B, again, negative 3, 1. No, not how it works. So that is our answer for that question. And we can keep going. Question number 19. A food truck sells salads for six fifty each and drinks for two each, two dollars each. A food truck's revenue from selling a total of two hundred nine salads. Okay. Two hundred nine salads and drinks in one day was eight hundred and thirty-six dollars and fifty cents. How many salads were sold that day? Okay, so before we, we think about like you know, like actually solving this, we need to think about like how are we going to set this up? So they sold two hundred nine salads and drinks. So number of salads, S. Number of drinks D is going to equal 209. And then each salad was 650, so that's going to be 6.5s and then $2 per drink. And they made like what, 836.5? Right? That's, that's it, right? Now, we have system of equation, so we can just, you know, we can just use elimination on this. So if we were to use elimination on this, how do we go about doing this? So we can multiply this by 2. This by 2, and you get 2s plus 2d equals 418. 
subtract this cancels out this gives you 4.5s equals 418.5 pull out your calculator 418.5 divided by 4.5 is going to be 93 so 93 salads and 93 salads all right question 20 alma brought a laptop computer at a store they gave a 20 percent discount off its original price the 20 percent discount off the original price that would be 0 0.8 and then original price is oh and the, then total amount she paid to the cashier was p dollars which is uh, including eight percent sales tax so that's just like 1.8 times this equals p now we're trying to find original price o in terms of p so we can just divide these out and get p over 0 0.8 times 1.08 no problems and that is our answer choice d okay choice d is our answer and we are good let's okay so this question they on the table were produced but using a sleep researcher studying the number of dreams people recall when asked to record their dreams for one week group x consisted of 100 people who observed early bedtimes and group y consisted of 100 people who observed later bedtimes person is chosen at random from those who recalled at least one dream was for the other person belong to group y okay so let's see so for x there were 85 people who recalled at least one dream right i took the 100 and then subtracted the one with none which would be 15. so then group y would be uh 100 minus 21 so it'd be 79. so it'd just be the number of times that it was group y 79 over the total which is 85 plus 79. that's going to be 79 over what 164. 79 over 164 is choice c and that is our answer we can move on to the next question okay so we're given this massive data table, all right? So let's try to understand it first a little bit before we get to the question. So annual budgets for different programs in Kansas from 2007 to 2010. We have agriculture, natural resources, education, general government, highways and transportation, human resources, and public safety. Okay. And we're asked which of the following best approximates the average rate of change in the annual budget for agricultural slash natural resources in Kansas from 2008 to 2010. Okay, so we can call, I mean, if we set like a function for agriculture slash natural resources, we could say it's, and well, it's A and R. Actually, that's, that seems a bit long. Let's just call it A. All right, so A of, of 2010. So that's the bigger number. So we're going to start with that. A of 2010. That's the amount of money spent in 2010 for this A and R, agriculture natural resources, minus A of 2008. So that is the change between these years. And we want the average rate of change. So we, well, what was that? So with the average rate of change, so we uh, divide by 2010, minus 2008. And this comes out to be, comes out to be 488106 minus um, 358708 over 2 which is going to be six, four, six, nine, nine, which is roughly 65, oops, that was bad. Why did that look like an eight? 65,000 a year. And now if you can see, it says table above with an annual budget and thousands of dollars. So this is 65,000. Or sixty-five million dollars per year, which is going to be choice B. Choice B. And we can move on to the next question. Okay. Okay, so question number twenty-three of the following which programs ratio two thousand seven budget to two thousand ten budget is close to the human resources programs ratio. A 2007 budget to 2010 budget. So human resources, right? So we can just call that H. H of 2007 
over 8 to 10. And we want that to be roughly equal. Oops. We want that to be roughly equal. Roughly equal to something of 2010. Sorry. 2007. Over something of 2010. Right, so this could be... So there are, our choices are A, agricultural natural resources, then education, uh, highways of transportation, we'll call that T, since we already used H there, and then S for public safety. Safety. Okay, so um, H of 2007 is going to be 40051050, and it's going to be over 2010, 5921379. So this ratio is going to be roughly 0 0.684, 0 0.684. And we want something that is roughly that over here, right? So something that applies here, so we can try A and R. Let's try A, right? So let's scroll up a little bit. So 4881, oh, sorry. It's 373904 over 488106. So oops, this gives 0 0.766. So that's not correct. E gives uh, um, 216400, uh, sorry, 607 over 3008. 36, which is 0 0.720. Uh, transportation gives uh, uh, 1468482 over 1773893, which is going to be 0 0.828, so way off. So we can guess it's probably going to be safety, but we have to, we have to try it out anyway. So 263463. Over four six four two three three, and that gives us zero point five six seven five. And this is why you try it out because actually it's not so clear which one it is. Right, we don't actually know. We don't actually know which one it is. Right, so we were given agriculture, and natural resources. We tried education. Tried transportation. And then we did a public safety. We want the program ratio of 2007 budget, 2010 budget. So we did that. We did that. Now we have these four values. And, and then we have, this is the actual ratio it should be. Right, so we can recheck all of these, but we can, this is the closest out of all of them. Right, this is the closest to that. So as of right now, our answer seems to be education. But since none of these are particularly close to that, we're just going to redo all, we have to redo all of them. So, let's try it, I mean, it's really just punching numbers into a calculator, right? Like, it's not really that hard. All right, and then education, 2164607 over 3008036. And then uh, highway transportation, 1468482. Over one seven seven three eight nine three, and then two six three four six three, over four six four two three three. Yeah, I mean, so we, I get the same thing as before, which is expected, you know. But our answer here is now going to be E. It might be a little bit off, but still is point four. It's close to anything else, and it's not that far away. So our answer here is going to be B, education, and we move on to the next question. Okay. Which of the following is the equation of a circle? Equation of a circle in the xy plane with center 0, 4 and radius with an endpoint 4, 3, and then 5. Okay, so if it has center 0, 4, that's going to be. We can, so we can write the equation as x squared plus y minus 4 squared equals r squared. Alright, so it's x minus the center for the center x coordinate, so x minus 0, x squared, y, y minus center y coordinate, so y minus 4 squared, equals the radius squared. Then we need to find the radius, right? And so we're starting at 0, 4, 
as the center, and we have a point on the circle as 4 thirds and 5. The difference here is, what, that's going to be 4 thirds and then 1. And we want to find this distance, right? We want to find this between these two things, which is just Pythagorean theorem on that, on 4 thirds and 1. Now, you could just back that up, but you could also recognize that 1 equals 3 thirds. This is 3 thirds and 4 thirds. So 3, 4, 5, so that's going to give you 5 thirds. So this difference is 5 thirds. So this right here is going to be 5 thirds squared, which is 25 over 9. So x squared plus y minus 4 squared equals 25 over 9. That is going to be answer choice A. Oops, that was horrible. Answer choice A. And we can move on to the next question. Okay. Next question. <coughs> the equation. The equation above expresses the approximate height h in meters of a ball t seconds after it's launched vertically upward from the ground. With an initial velocity of 25 meters per second, after approximately how many seconds will the ball hit the ground? Okay, so, I mean, we just want to solve this equation, right? So, h equals negative 4.9t squared minus 25t. Or plus 25t, sorry. So now, when the ball hits the ground, h is zero. So we really just want to solve for like the actual, this actual quadratic, where we just have, this is zero. So now what we can do is we can factor this into t times negative 4.9t plus 25. So obviously, if t is zero at the beginning, it's on the ground, you know, like before you shoot, it's on the ground. And then you need to find, you want to find this t right here, this t, because that'll tell you when it hits the ground again. So when, when this right here, when this part right here is zero, so negative 4.9t plus 25 equals zero, then this is all going to check out. So we want to find this t for this equation, so it's going to be 25 over 4.9, which is t equals 5.102. So 5.102, that's closest to 5.0, which is answer choice D. And we can move on to the next question. All right, question 26. Katarina is a botanist studying the production of pears by two types of pear trees. She noticed that type A trees produce 20% more pears than type B trees did. Based on Katrina's observation, if type A your type A plants produce 144 plants. How many pairs did the type B trees produce? So this is, so 144, we can write this as is 20% more than, than the number for type B, which is what we're trying to find, right? So the number for type B. So this is 144 then, it's going to be 1.2 times the number for type B. So we divide by the 1.2 and we get 120 is the number for type B. So our answer is going to be 120, or choice B. Choice B. That is our answer, and we can move on to the next question. Let's keep going. All right, so 27, a square field measures 10 meters by 10 meters. 10 students each mark off a randomly selected region of the field. Each region is square and has side lengths of one meter, and no two regions overlap. The students count the number of earthworms contained in the soil to a depth of five centimeters below the ground surface in each region. There's also shown in the table below. So which of the following is a reasonable estimation of the number of earthworms to a depth of five centimeters? beneath the ground surface in the entire field. All right, so first what we can do is we can just add up all of these. So this is going to account for five centimeters, oops, five centimeters down, 
five centimeters down over ten square meters. Because each region is one square meter and you have ten students. Now you want five centimeters down for a hundred square meters. So whatever you get here, you're just gonna multiply that by ten and you get this. Right? So add up all of that. So 107 plus 147 plus 146 plus 135 plus yeah, you get the point. You just keep adding them up. And you get 1471 times 10, 1, 4, 7, 1, 0, which is roughly 15,000. 15,000 is choice C. Choice C, that is our answer, and we can keep on going to the next question. The system of inequalities y is greater than 2x plus 1 and y is greater than 1 half x minus 1 is drawn from the xy plane above. Which quadrant contains no solutions to the system? Okay, so y is greater than 2x plus 1. y is greater than 2x plus 1. Oops. x plus 1 and y is less than, or actually greater than, greater than. 1 half x minus 1. Okay. So let's, let's just try some out, right? So if x is positive, then you can get this to be positive. No, oops. If x is positive, then you can get this to be positive. Right? No matter what positive x you have, you can end up with a positive y. Right? No matter what. And so no matter what positive x you get here, you end up with a positive y. Now here you can have a positive x, and you can get a negative y if the x is less than 2. But then, that, this would be negative, but this would still have to be positive, because it's also be bigger than this. So y has to be bigger than both this and this. Right? Now if it has to be bigger than both of these, if x is... If x is positive, then y is positive. y is positive. Because no matter what positive x you have, this 2x plus 1 is going to be positive, and y is bigger than that, so y has to be positive. So if x is positive, then y is positive. Which means that you can't have, something that you can't have is a positive x with a negative y. You cannot have a positive x and a negative y. Positive x, negative y, it's quadrant 4. So our answer is quadrant 4, which is choice C. So that's our answer. Now, if you're wondering what we could do with the negative x, right? If you have a negative x, then obviously if it's like negative infinity, then you can just get a ne another negative. If you have negative x and you have... um. Let's say negative one half. If you put negative one half into the, uh, that doesn't work. If you put negative one four into this equation, right? Then you can get then you can get this will be uh, this will be negative, but this will be positive, so you can get a positive y, right? So quadrant four is the one that you can't do. So our answer is C, and we can keep going to the next question. Okay. For a polynomial p of x, the value of p of 3 is negative 2. All right, so first thing, p of 3 is negative 2. p of 3 is negative 2. Which of the following must be true about p of x? x minus 5 is a factor of p of x. x minus 2 is a factor of p of x. x plus 2 is a factor of p of x. The remainder when p of x is divided by x minus 3 is negative 2. Okay, so... There are two theorems called the factor theorem and the remainder theorem. Now, these theorems are actually a bit complicated, but so you, so you don't really need to know them for the purpose of this, but you need to understand what the concepts behind them, right? So when we say that x minus 5 
if x minus 5 is a factor of p of x, right, then, then p of 5 equals 0. Boom. Right, this is this is kind of the essence behind the factor theorem, but this is something that you need to understand just algebraically why this works. Right, because I mean, if, if p of x, if x, if, sorry, if x minus 5 is a factor of p of x, then you can write this as like x minus 5 times some other polynomial. So then p of 5 is going to be q of 5 times 5 minus 5. And this is going to be zero. Oops. This is going to be zero. But then this is going to be zero. So p of 5 is going to be zero. So if x minus something is a factor of p of x, then p of that something is going to be zero. So if x minus 5 is p of 5, zero, we don't know. x minus 2 is p of 2, zero. No idea. x plus 2, so is negative 2, right? Because x minus negative 2 is x plus 2. Is p of negative 2 a factor of zero? We don't know. So that brings us to choice D, which, I mean, at this point you know it's correct, but still, the concept stands that the remainder from P of X divided by X minus 3 is negative 2. That's called, this is the remainder theorem. So you can explore the concepts behind the remainder theorem. So now, we can again write P of X. Let's write this as X minus 3 times Q of X. Now... If I plug in p of 3 into here, then I get p of 3 equals 3 minus 3, so this is 0. But p of 3 is negative 2, so I have to put a negative 2 here. So I have to put a negative 2 here. So I think you can start to see where this is going. p of x is x minus 3 times some other polynomial minus 2. So if I divide p of x, by x minus 3, my quotient is q of x, you know, quotient q, it's almost like that was planned out, who knew, q of x plus then, uh, actually it would be negative, negative 2 over x minus 3, and this is the remainder, negative, negative 2, so that is the constant behind the remainder theorem, and our answer is choice d, let us keep on going. Um, oops. Okay. Ooh, let's see. So we have x, y equals x squared, y equals x squared minus 2x minus 15. Which of the following is an equivalent form of the equation of the graph from the x, y plane above from which the coordinates of vertex A can be identified as constants in the equation? So we want to find vertex form because we're trying to find something where the coordinates of the vertex can be found in the equation. So vertex form is usually known as like the form that you get when you complete the square, which nobody likes completing the square, but it is a very useful thing. So what do we do? All right, so the first thing you can see when you look at the answer choices is, are any of them like squares? Like, and you can see choice D is an X minus one square. So you can, you know that that's probably correct. And it does turn out to actually be correct. So, I mean, we know that because completing the square, it's going to be a square. So the vertex form has to have a square. You could factor it out, which would be a different form. And that would give you what? X, X plus 3 times X minus 5. So, yeah, you could do that. But that has the roots in it, not the vertex. The vertex is the square, the completing the square. X minus 1 squared minus 16. So our answer here is the one with the square in it. Choice D. And now we move on, and we are on the gridded response questions. All right, gridded response questions. Okay, let's see. Why can husk at least 12 dozen ears of corn per hour and at most 18 dozen corn ears of corn per hour? Based on this information, what is the possible amount of time in hours that it would take Y to husk 72 dozen ears of corn? Okay, so the... Most amount of time it was it is if he's working the slowest. So seventy-two over the slowest time, which is twelve. Six. 
the fastest would be 72 over his fastest time, which would be, or, yeah, it's 18, so that's going to be 4. Between 4 and 6. You can put any number between 4 and 6. You could, I don't care, you could put, like, 5.17 or something, and it would be right. But, you know, just for the sake of it, I'll just put 5. Just anything in between, you can put 4 and 6, you can put anything in between, it all works. Because all in that range, it's all valid. Let's keep going. Okay, the posted weight limit for a covered wooden bridge in Pennsylvania is 6,000 pounds. A delivery truck that is carrying ex-identical boxes, each weighing 40, 14 pounds, will pass over the bridge. If the combined weight of the empty delivery truck and its driver is 4,500 pounds, 4,500 pounds, what is the maximum possible value? Maximum possible value for X, I will keep the combined weight of the truck driver and boxes below the bridge's post weight limit. 4,500 pounds with X boxes, and each of them is 14 pounds. So that's going to be 14 times X. That has to be less than the weight limit, which is 6,000. So, I mean, now you just have this. 14x is less than uh, 1,500. You divide by the 14. And that's going to be 107. 107, and then you have two 14s left over. You can check that on the calculator if you want. But, I'm, I'm yeah, that's correct. All right, so our answer would be 107. That is it. And we can keep on going. Okay. Number of portable media players sold worldwide each year from 2006 to 2011. And have graph. Going to the line graph above, the number of portable media players sold in 2008, which would be 100. It, oops. The 100 is, is what fraction of the number sold in 2011? So 2011, it looks like there were 160 sold. So there was 160 sold. So it's just going to be 100 over 160, 5 eighths, if you simplify it. 5 eighths. And that is our answer. Let's keep going. Okay. So if we go next to question 34, a local television station sells time slots for programs in 30 minute intervals. The station operates 24 hours per day, every day of the week. What is the total number of uh, t 30 minute time slots the station can sell for Tuesday and Wednesday? So that's two days. Oops. Two days. 24 hours each day. 60 minutes in an hour. That's how many minutes you have in those two days. And you have 30 minute time slots. So this cancels with that and you get 2. 2 times 2 times 24 is going to be 96. So you have 96 time slots. Let's keep going. Right, so these questions, the greater response questions, are seem like really hard. Huh? But really, they're just kind of simple questions that you just don't have choice system. So it seems harder, but they're actually made to be simpler questions than the other ones because the creators know that you're going to freak out. So they, they want to make it like uh, easier, easier, easier. So in this question, we see height is eight, uh, eight yards. The dairy farmer uses a storage cell that is in the shape of a right circular cylinder above. If the volume is 72 pi cubic yards, 72 pi cubic yards, uh, everything is in yards, so I don't really need to write units. What is the diameter of the base of the cylinder? So a right circular cylinder can be found by using pi r squared h. So I can cancel the pi out, and then h is 8. So now I have 72 equals 8r8 squared. So r squared equals 9, r8 equals 3. We need to find diameter, so just times 2. And diameter equals 6. 6 yards, that is the diameter right there. And we can keep on going. Okay. So for 36, oh. For what value of x is the function h above undefined? So we have 1 over x minus 5 squared plus 4 x minus 5 plus 4. And we want to know when it's undefined. So when this is 0, when this part is 0. Okay. 
So, how are we going to do that? So, this might look a little complicated, but I can do one thing that's really nice. So, I can say y equals x minus 5. And now, this is suddenly, we're just trying to make y squared plus 4y plus 4 equal to 0. Okay? Now, y squared plus 4y plus 4, you can do a quadratic formula on this, but it's really unnecessary. You can factor it, or you can recognize this is a perfect square. This is y plus 2 squared. y plus 2 squared. And it's supposed to equal 0, right? So, so that means that y plus 2 equals 0, and y equals negative 2. Negative 2. So, if y equals x minus 5, which equals negative 2, then that means that x is going to equal 3. So in this this uh this problem, what we really did is we just saw this is complicated, but it comes up a bunch of times. I can just set another variable that's easier equal to that and solve for that, and then figure out x at the end, and it'll work a lot easier. So that is our answer, and we can keep going to the next question. Okay, Jess Jessica opened a bank account that earns two percent interest compounded annually. Her initial deposit was a hundred dollars. And choose the equation $100 x of t to find the value of the account after t years. What is the value of t in the expression? Okay, so uh, let's see. So every t years, her account is going to be multiplied. So multiplied, multiplied by x. Right, you go from x 100x to the 0 to 100x to the 1 to 100x to the 2 <laughs> every year. You multiply by x. Multiplied by x. By x. So, in each year you compound it by 2. Compound it. Compound it by 2%. Okay? So, if we multiply by x and we compound it by 2%, what does that mean? That means compounding by 2% is multiplying it by 1.02. This is also what x is going to be. Because every year we multiply it by 1.02. 1.02 is our answer. And we can keep going to the last question of this set. All right. Jessica's friend Taishan found an account that earns 2.5% interest compound annually. Taishan makes an initial deposit of $100 into this account. At the same time, Jessica made her deposit. And after 10 years, how much more money will Taishan's initial deposit have earned than Jessica's initial deposit? So Taishan would have $100 times 2.5 to the T, T years, which is 10, because after 10 years. And then Jessica would have 100 times 2 to the T, or 2 to the 10. Now, this, 100 times 2 to the 5, or 2.5, to the 10 times 100 minus 2 uh, minus 2 to the 10 times 100 is going to be is going to be um going to be a very big number so oh, actually wait hold on false alarm this is not how the equation should be written okay so that's 2.5% interest. So it would be 100 and then 1.025 to the 10. And 100 times 1.02 to the 10. You're wondering why the numbers are so big. Okay. So 1.025 to the 10. 10. And that is going to be. That is going to be all in all. That is going to be six bucks. So, as you can see, you don't earn much from interest. At least you don't, not, not that much. But the answer is six dollars. And that is the end of this SAT math calculator active test. Right, please stay tuned for more videos. We're going to have videos on the math non calculator section as well as the reading and writing section for this practice test as well as many more. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to like and subscribe, and I will see you next time.